Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. spread faster than the sudden heat could spread disease. It created monsters from the best and made the devil of the worst. My kind departed from one another so that we would not devour our own. of food and supplies. They filled the days with bloodshed and the nights with screams from the slain. Rate, episode 91. I am Tom Merritt. He hey. is Brian Brushwood. Yeah, and this is Wastelander Panda. See, that's a good freeze. I need to make that my avatar right now. Uh, I could have sworn we talked about Wastelander Panda a while ago, but for some reason it got stuck in my mind, and I went back and looked it up, and they said that they're making three webisodes this year from Epic Films. Basically, these guys are telling a crazy post-Holocaust story about a panda who's being discovered surviving among the wastes and a sad always... sad panda <laughs> it is the saddest panda which might have been the original title they were going to but uh but i tell you i love the vibe of this thing i love the direction it it it's enchanting and just absurdist at the same time way way excited about it more excited about that than uh world of warcraft expansion the mist of pandaria Yes, way more, because this looks serious, whereas Mists of Pandaria doesn't look very serious to I me. don't know. The Alliance and the Horde are going to war again. That's pretty serious. Over pandas? Uh, and pandas get caught in the middle. O- over who loves pandas more? And it's, who- like, it's like the Miller Light War. They're like, uh, black and white, more fuzzy. Black and white, more fuzzy. They're arguing about why they love pandas? I don't know, man. I think it's going to be bad for the pandas. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Let's start Perfect. off with our big story. This just in, the big story. GigaOM has a story from Liz Shannon Miller about how dire- Arrested Development on Netflix could change everything. Of course, we've been talking about this for weeks. They're, they're shooting Arrested Development. The scripts are written. They're twittering from the shoots. Everybody's involved. Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. The Arrested Development fans are insane. Uh, but Liz Shannon Miller kind of takes a step back and says, think about what this means. For one thing, uh, they say that uh, a resident development, which has an order for 10 episodes, I believe, might have 13. And that is something that would never happen in a television, in the in television industry because you order 10 episodes, you only have room for 10 episodes. That's it. You're paying like certain million per episode. Whereas Netflix has the flexibility to say, look, we're going to launch them all at the same time. So, you know, if, if, if we can afford the money or if it doesn't go over the budget then yeah, give us more episodes. We're fine with that. Uh, we, lo- we lost Brian, so I'm talking to myself right now. Um, should, uh, this, uh, anyway, the, David Cross, who plays Tobias in Arrested Development, uh, says this makes Lost look like a Spalding Gray monologue. And he's talking there specifically about the fact that they have written Arrested Development uh, with the idea that you'll binge watch them. They're knowing that Netflix is going to put them all out at once, they're making some very intricate plot developments. They're weaving certain storylines through that they, they, they think that you may need to watch the episodes a couple times to get. Uh, here's the important question, Tom. Did you manage to keep the conversation afloat the entire time that my internet went out and I had to reconnect? I did and have now- to acknowledge that you were gone because I oh. turned to look at you and <laughs> you weren't there. 
<laughs> and there was this guy right here. There's no, the pan. No, it was just a, just a Skype screen. If there had been that guy, I would ask that guy a question. Okay, so I don't know if you already addressed this or not, but uh, I am weirdly, and Justin Robert Young and I have gone back and forth on this, I think I'm weirdly disappointed that they're going to release it all at once. And I understand that binging has its certain benefits, but there's a reason that the standard model has been week over week releases. And if the whole reason they're spending this money for Netflix is to make this a giant publicity bonanza to take all the goodwill people have to Arrested Development and focus it to Netflix instead, then it seems like you want that to happen for more than a week. It's like, I don't want this release to be a one-week event. I want it to be a three-month event where every single week I get to talk to my friends about how excited I am about the next thing or whatever. I, I Maybe I'm making this all up, but but uh, do, do you have any hesitation about the release it all at once nature of this? Uh, I, no, I don't. I, I do acknowledge what you're saying. You do lose the aspect of, oh, hey, we're all around the water cooler and we all watch Lost and Lost just came out and we could talk about last night's episode. That's been going away for years. And frankly, bemoaning that is like bemoaning the fact that we all used to go down to the record store and wait in line for the new record to come out. That was fun, but would I rather go back to doing that in exchange for not having downloadable music? No. Uh, no so it, so it's, it, it's, it's definitely a loss, but for me, the fact that I have the convenience to watch what I want, when I want, anytime I want, and I don't have to wait. If I want to wait a week between episodes, I can, uh, but I don't have to. I, I think that's the way to go. It says, look, it's in your hands. You're in control. And what you're saying is, I kind of don't like being in control sometimes. I, I don't think you're alone no, in that. I, I, it's not quite that. It's sort of a, and, and I, I'm the first to confess that this could be a case of, I hate when people mistake associations. Like, for example, when the Kindle came out, everyone's like, oh, but I like books. That that acidic smell and the, you know, from the books and, and the, the paper cuts the and ages and yeah, and, and they... They confused the medium for the message, right? And what they actually loved was the experience of being up at 3 a.m. And my daughter, who actually is just starting to read uh, Ender's Game right now, she's in third grade reading Ender's Game. We had to, She got busted at 2 a.m. reading it on, on her Kindle. She will have those same associations with the Kindle and the clicking. And it's like, oh, I just liked that little flash in between one page to another. So it's like I, I don't know how much of this affection is for what I've known in the past. I just – um. I just would hate after all of this to have it only be something everyone's excited about for one week. And if there's a way to stretch it out, because think about how much we talk about Breaking Bad. Think about the spoiler zone. How would we handle a spoiler zone in a post-spoiler world where everything's released all at once? And it's up to you to, to guide your own journey through a narrative series like Arrested Development. It's, it's just an interesting space, and I don't know necessarily how I'm going to feel about it long term. Well, think about it this way, right? And I, I, I almost went really snotty on this, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I'm not. I'm not from here going choose not to be passive aggressive but you have the same problem with books right with books everybody can buy them and read them at their own pace so people are at different points in books but yet they're still book clubs and you can still have shows about books where people discuss books it's not the same right and again it's that same thing of like yeah you don't get to have the spoiler zone where everybody's like okay if you're up to date watch because we're only going to talk about the most recent episode but but even this week we're not going to have a spoiler zone because you didn't watch breaking bad last night no, that's true. And I'll tell you what, actually, I'm going to take something from the chat room. Mojam, M-O-J-A-A-M, points out that uh, judging by how I'm watching H+, and other YouTube things versus things on Netflix, I'd prefer to binge it. Which is funny because, like, I'm worried about the, the nature of releasing all of Arrested Development at once. But that's my one frustration with H+, Plus is because it's these bite-sized chips. It's like I want a whole bag of them to eat. And the fact that I'm only getting, like, eight episodes in and we're two weeks into it is kind of driving me nuts. So so maybe maybe I'm totally wrong on this whole thing. I, yeah, I, I, it's, uh, Web4857 says, I hate to tell you this, but books are dying among the young. I'm not even sure that's true. But that's even not- if it is, that's beside the point. The point is we're still able to talk about books even though their release schedule is uh, you, determined by you as far as how far into a book you are and when you're done and all that. And, and, and that's, I look at this as the change from, oh gosh, you remember when Charles Dickens would put his books out as a serialized uh, element of a magazine and we'd all get the, we'd all go and buy the tabloid and read the latest part of Great Expectations and then talk about it. I miss, nobody, nobody misses those days. Because right. that's just not the way it works anymore. Yeah. And I think that's what we're seeing is the, the serialized novel 
or in this case, the television show is becoming the novel. And, and we're yes. getting all of Arrested Development at once. And that makes that makes sense, too, because think about binging uh, on an entire series. And, and this is why I felt like for a long time that in many ways uh, you could tell much, much stronger narratives with television because you just have a bigger palette to work with. You have more time to convey more character development. Uh, now, answer me this. Did you did you comment on the uh, the quote from David Cross talking about how they don't even know how many episodes they have right now? Yeah, that's what I was talking about right when we got you back on. Uh, the fact that this is, and and getting back to the story from Gigaom, this this is the more interesting point to me is they're changing the model about how television production is conducted by saying we're going to give you this much money and we want around ten episodes. You got thirteen in you? Great, we'll take thirteen. We don't have a big issue with that because we're going to put them all out at once anyway. Whereas a television network says, no, we've got ten slots. It's got to be ten episodes, and we'll pay you per episode, and that's it. Right. Well, and, and uh, you know, and obviously there's there's uh, prearranged deals that make that possible. But I love that this is so similar to the way that we run things here on the Twit Network, where it's like we want frame rate to be about an hour. And occasionally we go a little bit over or a little bit under. But, yeah, it's pretty much an hour. And uh, that freedom to, to to not have to overstretch or overhammer or, or to overcondense things, but instead let them be the right length for what it is you're trying to say, I think it's, it's a real it's a real bonus. It's a real benefit to the end viewer. Yeah, and, and I, I think uh, that uh, Liz Shannon Miller at GigaOM has a, has a great piece. Uh, I encourage people to go check it out and read it. Uh, it's called Why Arrested Development on Netflix Could Change Everything. Obviously, she, she's aware that it doesn't necessarily mean it will change everything, but she's got some really good points about how this is the beginning of the model starting to change. And television producers, I mean, we've had Dana Brunetti, who's behind House of Cards, which is coming to Netflix on this show, they're excited about having a different way of going about things, about a, a different way of being able to produce and tell these stories and a different way of distributing them. So it's yeah. pretty exciting. Let's move on to another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. So we've talked a lot about Apple TV and the idea of uh, Apple coming out with a television, not the box that they have now, Apple TV, but this, this idea that they would revolutionize home video viewing with a new television that integrated into your existing cable subscription but also gave you Internet. Uh, and there had even been some hits from Tim Cook that maybe we might see something by the end of this year. Now Andy Hargreaves, who's an analyst uh, with Pacific Crest, has had a conversation with Eddie Q, who's the guy in charge of Internet services at Apple, and uh, Peter Oppenheimer, who's the uh, uh, chief financial officer, and they told him pretty much uh, they're not able to work out a deal with the folks in the cable industry, and so they don't see themselves being able to come out with an Apple TV anytime soon. Here's the quote from Hargreaves. He says, Q's commentary suggested that it would be an incomplete solution from Apple's perspective, unless it could deliver content in a way that is different from the current multi-channel pay TV model. And it sounds like they're not able to convince anybody to change that model. So this also sounds like we, of all the times we've discussed this possibility of a product, the thing that we've always been excited about has been about the advancement of the ecosystem we have noticed i don't think once we've talked about what kind of hardware the screen would be made of i don't think once we've speculated on what kind of hardware would drive the software portion of it we've only been concerned with one thing will this be the the magical i don't know what channel anything's on i just know what i want to see i want good suggestions so i can watch anything i want anytime i want which is of course all we want here on frame rate uh and the entire time in the back of my mind, I've been thinking like, won't that be hard to get everyone on board with considering, you know, because uh, the two themes that we see from consumers on this show are people who want to be able to watch whatever they want. And then we see content owners fighting tooth and nail to preserve, uh, you know, when and where and how thou shalt see their content. And it's like, I, I totally believe that even the mighty Apple would not have the juice to, to force everyone into a coalition to make this happen. If if it doesn't happen, if I believe it's all the behind the scenes maneuvering that just uh, the, there's too much infighting, too much, too many different visions of what people want, too many people possessive over their their content ownership distribution rights or whatever. And I could totally see that eventually just crapping out. I I could see them getting the uh, the distributor on board, right? Like, especially somebody who's a little bit behind. Somebody like a Dish, which we've heard rumored 
to be in, com- in close consultation with Dish about this. I could see them even getting a particular channel operator like a CBS. And in fact, we've heard CBS kind of leak out uh, the fact that they've been in talks with Apple to say, okay, you don't have a huge list of channels that you're trying to force on an operator. What if we uh, give you authentication and we allow you to sell your, your shows directly through to the audience? I could see them getting that, but they can't get the whole thing at once. They can't get all the channels uh, and a distributor to agree to a package. It's just too many moving points, parts. So the question is, can they adapt whatever it is this revolutionary interface is to work with a less than perfect model? For instance, when they started selling TV shows, they were only selling TV shows from ABC Disney at the beginning. Right. Uh, and they were able to grow it from there. Could so, they do something like that? Or is it the kind of thing, and this is what it sounds like Eddie Q is saying, is it's not the kind of thing you can do. You either have to do it right or you don't do it at all. So do you think that this is a case where, uh, you know, uh, Apple already saved, in, saved. I'm using air quotes for all the audio listeners, uh, saved an industry once with iTunes by, by swooping in when everybody was filled with despair and they knew, you know, completely knew that, that piracy was going to destroy all of music because of online file sharing. And then they were able to come in and bully everyone as this, this one-stop shop, like 99 cents a track, get on or be left behind. And then they were able to broker this giant deal where everyone basically, except the Beatles, got online with it. Uh, and, and is the case where there's not enough despair in the video side of the market now for them to pull off a similar kind of Hail Mary move? Here's what I think has to happen, and it hasn't happened yet, right? So Apple's too far ahead of the game. I, I think what has to happen is you have to have the pressure on the channels and the distributor start coming from the outside. Uh, and we started, we predicted this. You and I predicted this a couple of years ago that these outside services were going to have to start making their own content. And at the time, it felt like a crazy thing to say because it's like, well, YouTube has some 10-minute shows and stuff, but nobody's ever going to compete. People would say nobody's ever going to compete with the million-dollar budgets of production companies. But that's exactly what didn't matter because Netflix and Hulu are going to the people with those budgets and saying, we'll pay you to make the shows for us. Right Right. now, we've only seen Lily Hammer come to Netflix. We've only seen mostly shows come to Hulu from outside and be Hulu originals, but not really produced by Hulu. I think maybe next week, Amazon, at their September 6th announcement, because it's in Santa Monica, may have something to do with Amazon original programming. And we know they're developing original programming. Netflix in 2013 is going to have a bunch of big hits. They're going to have House of Cards. They're going to have Arrested Development. They're going to have a few others. Hulu is adding new original programming all the time. I think it's going to take another year, two, or maybe two, for momentum to get behind one of these services. It doesn't matter which one, where people start to say, oh, I really have to have that service because they have my favorite show, or they have great shows, and they start to get that reputation of being an HBO. That's when the pressure comes from outside, and the distributors start to feel people actually choosing independence like Netflix and Hulu over getting cable that they start to come to the table and say, Apple, we need you to help us. Right now, they don't, I mean, they say it outright. We don't think we need the help. We think the reason we're seeing any kind of subscription declines is economic, not because of the internet. So they don't feel, if that's what they believe, then they don't feel like Apple's offering them anything. Do you think there's any amount of money that you could offer to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox to allow them uh, to use, to give their programming to a subscription kind of service uh, or do you feel like those those companies are just too embroiled with their existing deals to where something like that could never happen? Because there's got to be some kind of price at which point, like as a consumer, I'm already bl- I'm setting fire to like $150 every month just f- just to have the gates open to content. Now, granted, there's only like four things inside this magic shopping mall that I bother to go get, but it's like there's got to be a better way. It's like if I could just give, I would still give 150 bucks a month if if I could have that magic interface in the living room where it's just anything I wanted at any time. But you've got to get you've got to get the existing players to think there's a benefit to that. And what we're where where we're at is HBO is the perfect example for this, right? You pay HBO almost directly through your cable company to get their programming. There's no advertisements. Uh, it is exactly. To us as consumers, the kind of thing that's like, well, why can't I just pay for that? Just pay for that on the web. And what we found out is HBO gets a lot of benefit from going through the cable companies. They get a lot of free marketing. They get a lot of free advertising. And right now, 
the calculus for them says, if we had to pay for that marketing push on our own, we would not be making as much money. And so there's no benefit to us changing that model yet. And okay. until, until that happens, until they look at it and go, you know what, we're not getting the bang for our, our buck out of the free marketing from the cable companies because so many people have moved to the internet, we're going to have to move to the internet because it makes financial sense. The conditions have to change to push a, a channel to see the benefit in bucking the cable companies. So I'm going to put on my speculative hat, and I want you to do the same. I'm going to predict, and I don't know why I feel this. This is a completely irrational belief, but I feel like it's going to be a very steep change all at once. It's going to be uh, all of a sudden the bottom just gets knocked out from this market, and all of a sudden there's a lot less money in it, and all of a sudden the cable networks and the content distributors all need to play ball to figure out some way to make something happen. For some reason, I feel like there's a sea change coming and that nobody wants to acknowledge it yet. I, I don't think it'll be a slow transition from one to the other. And I have no rational or scientific basis for this. That's just what my gut says. What yeah, do you think? I, I think you're right because even though there is some, uh, some worry about piracy, right? And so it's similar to the music industry. There's also a similarity to the, to the publishing industry here, right? Because what happened is the books sort of went overnight when the Kindle came. Because up until then, the publishers saw no benefit in selling ebooks because there wasn't enough market to read them, and they were worried about undermining their existing print book industry. So it's a similar problem to what you're seeing with cable video. But what we will see happen is if somebody can move one of those blocks or the pressure comes from outside, very quickly they may say, oh, well, you know what, we need to transition over to that. Because we are seeing that with, with publishing right now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it'll be interesting to see... Uh whether or not we're right. I'll buy you a Coke if we're right. How about that? All right. Sounds good. Where are we now? We should, uh, we, we, it's time to move right on into the slipstream. Uh, real quickly, just a couple of notes. Uh, slipstream, of course, being the programming that you can access over the internet and watch. Uh, and Amazon uh, is uh, signing up new people all the time. Uh, they now have the ESPN 30 for 30 film series. Uh, available for Prime Instant Video, Brian. I know well, you're kind wait, of a fan. Did, did, didn't, didn't we just discuss this? I, I told you about, um, oh, wait, no, this is over on Amazon now, not Yeah, Netflix. yeah, yeah. It's already been okay. available on Netflix, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, this is great because I, uh, you know me, I'm not a sports guy at all, but the two episodes of that series that I've watched were exceptional. The one, of course, about the day that uh, everything interesting in sports happened, including OJ running from the law, and the other being about the, the founding of uh, the original Fantasy Baseball League, the Rotisserie League. Uh, both of them are excellent, and I can't, like, anytime somebody mentions to me they like sports, I tell them about, hey, I saw two sports documentaries that I really liked, and I don't like sports. So it was, yeah. uh, this is exciting to me. Good for them. Also, Amazon struck a deal with NBC Universal, a subsidiary of Comcast, uh, that'll bring hundreds of TV episodes, including Battlestar Galactica, Friday Night Lights, Heroes, Parks and Rec, all of that stuff to Amazon. So a lot of the stuff you can look at and say, oh, well, Netflix already has that. But Netflix has been making these deals for a few more years than Amazon Prime Instant Video has had. The, the, the underlying story is not that uh, the third place online network is catching up. The the the, the story is, is that more teams are solidifying in this struggle, and all of this serves to legitimize online distribution and content management, which is good news for everyone. Uh, Netflix, of course, not sitting still either, and we've talked a lot since last year's Quickster thing about as they lose deals, they're going to have to sign deals to convince people to come. Because I was just talking to a friend of mine over lunch, and she's like, yeah, I have Netflix Instant Streaming, but I still want a DVD service because they never have anything on instant video streaming that I really want to watch. Uh, obviously, that's not true. She wouldn't keep paying for Netflix Instant Streaming. But I know what she means, which is when she thinks of a movie she wants to watch, she knows if she has Netflix DVDs that she could probably find it. And she's used to that. Netflix Streaming, that's not the case. When you think of a movie... Eh, chances are it may or may not be there. Uh, Netflix will be expanding its streaming offerings next year with a deal with the uh, Harvey Weinstein uh, company, Radius TWC Distribution. So that will bring them a bunch of films uh, like The Bachelorette, uh, the, the movie, the Sundance movie Bachelorette, not the TV series Bachelorette, uh, The Details, <laughs> Only God Forgives, Drive. Uh, these, are, these are more indie, art, arty kinds of movies, but uh, they, that will expand their lineup for sure. Those are all bricks in the wall of awesome yes. that will close you in like the cask of Amontillado. And then you'll 
die satiated. This metaphor is falling apart very quickly. Let's move on to another metaphor, skipping ads. Actually, this isn't a metaphor at all. It's really being able to skip uh, <laughs> ads, uh, and, and YouTube is bringing it to mobile. They, they launched their video ad format. Now, think about this. One of the reasons they're bringing skippable ads to mobile is because the iOS YouTube app is going away in iOS 6. Yeah. And when that happens, YouTube will be able to show ads which means they need to have a way for the whole thing to be uh, available. And if you don't know, YouTube has a thing right now where you, you have to watch a portion of an ad, but at a certain point you get the ability to skip it, uh, and, and so you can click on that skip, and the advertiser so, isn't charged for the ads that you skip. So I am utterly astonished at how many of those ads that are skippable that I end up watching. It's amazing in that first seven seconds where there, so many of them are able to set up just barely an interesting enough narrative where it's like, I know it, essentially I'm going to watch a 60 second short story that has something to do with the product or service, but I'm shocked at how often I'm like, all right, I'll bite. Go ahead. Explain to me why my life's going to be better. Thanks to this product and or service. Do you, do you find yourself choosing to watch ads? Uh, no. I almost always skip. <laughs> really? Yeah. I'm, sh I'm shocked at how, like, they've gotten better at intriguing me in the first five seconds. And I'll, I'll stick around just to find out who's behind this. I'll tell you, with the exception or trailers for movie or TV show, if I haven't already seen it, I will watch it. But otherwise, I, I I'll almost 100% of the time skip it. Well, and, and we'll talk about uh, H plus later on, but uh, watching the ads in between at least once I got stuck where I'm like, I'm like, who on earth is paying for this? Because it's like, yeah, I don't know. It's like a puzzle because, you know, there's some money behind it. But but instantly, I don't know if it's the, the, the scam school in me that's like, you know, you know, who's where's the money going behind all this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hulu also updated uh, uh, its website. We, we talked about the updated web player a few weeks back and uh, now they've revamped the website Larger images, better highlighting of the latest episodes, new page layout. I, I, you know what? I almost didn't even notice. I saw the, the new layout before I saw the story about it, and it clicked to me like, oh, yeah, I guess something was a little different when I went over there. I, it's an improvement, but I don't think it's very drastic. I don't know why I don't use Hulu nearly as much as I use Netflix. I use the hell out of Netflix. I'll start something, go straight from beginning to end on the whole thing, watch, gobble the whole thing up. But in my mind, and tell me if this is wrong, because maybe I'm behind the times on this. In my mind, when I think of Hulu and library, I just think incomplete for anything. And it makes me reluctant to even look there for anything. Yeah. Because but, I'm just you sure. Know, a lot of people yeah. think of that uh, regarding Netflix in the breadth, right? But the thing is, when you find a series on Netflix, you're almost always going to find all the episodes in that series. Yes, or at least at least for seasons up to a certain point. For example, yeah. Breaking Bad, I think they have the first three seasons on there. Sons of Anarchy, that's how I got started. They had all of the first three seasons. But when I picture Hulu, I just picture this Swiss cheese of, you know, we got this one, a couple of these, maybe one of those. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, uh, Forbes has an article about Sky Angel. That's a Chattanooga, Tennessee network that we've talked about before. Sky Angel is a, uh, a, a Christian-based network that wants to provide family-friendly, faith-based uh, programming choices, and they want to do it over the Internet. Uh, it's too expensive for them to, to keep up with uh, satellite broadcast and laying cable, so they, they want to provide it over the Internet, and they've run into problems where, as they've transitioned to that, some networks have said, look, we, we don't have a problem selling you our programming at all, but we don't want it available over the Internet. We only want it available over traditional cables. And Sky Angel is the one that has gone to the FCC to complain, saying, hey, you know what, this, this needs to be regulated like, like it would on, on regular cable, just because we're using Internet cables instead of, the, you know, the, the cables laid in the ground by your cable company doesn't mean that they, they get to, to rake us over. They couldn't turn us down if we were a regular cable company or a satellite company why can they turn us down as an internet company? And that would be awesome if it didn't have the implications of if they open that door of regulating themselves as a cable company over the internet, then does Netflix have to get regulated as a cable company over the internet? Yeah, so uh, where are we at right now legally? They haven't started any actual trial stuff for this, have they? Well, it's not, it's not a court case thing. It's, a, it's an FCC appeal. And as far as I know, the FCC is still studying the issue. Okay, right on. I hope they I hope they make a billion dollars. How about that? That's my answer what I, to everything. What I love about Sky Angel is they're saying, look, this is this is the future. This is how we want to reach our audience. And we're not trying to pirate anything. We want to pay the pay the networks and we want to only have paying subscribers watch it. We're you know, we're not going to do anything to make it easy to pirate videos. That's not what we're about at all. 
We just want to deliver video to people over the internet instead of, and, and, and frankly, Comcast and Time Warner, all those people are doing the exact same thing, but they also have cable laid uh, that they can say, oh, well, yeah, our video demand stuff kind of goes over the same internet pipes, but, but really, we, we have a different system, so we need to be regulated differently. Yeah. No, I uh, look, I hope I wish them nothing but success. Uh, fight the fight the power. How about that? Let's move on to the tube tops. <laughs> tube tops all about the uh, equipment you use to receive the video that you want to watch. We, we haven't had a lot coming out in August. We should see this ramping up over the fall, especially with uh, IFA happening in Ber- Berlin. That's a big electronics conference there. One of the things we expect to see at IFA is the high sense pulse a Google TV set-top box that should be coming out in November for $99, uh, 1080p, HDMI, USB, Ethernet, and Wi-Fi, and a double-sided remote with a full QWERTY keyboard on one side and a touchpad and a dedicated Netflix button on the other. Now, <coughs> sorry, I just tried to breathe uh, spit. Don't do that. Um, <coughs> how price sensitive are you when it comes to Google TV devices because everyone it seems like they all come out for $99 and there's a perverse part of my brain that that associates sub $100 with inferior uh quality and well, no, there's that's, some- that's interesting yeah. that you say that because really the only other one I can think of that's $99 is the one from Vizio uh, wait, no, well, they dropped the Logitech review, which well, was... Well, but that was a sell-off. That wasn't a, yeah. an introductory price, but okay, I got you. But, but it's like, like how much, like, there's some part of me that wants it to be more expensive because I just want it to be superior power. I want the user interface to be even better. And, I, and for some reason, I irrationally associate that with a higher price tag. You're what, like, what, what do you think the perfect price for a Google TV box is? Uh, and, and what would you expect from it, I guess, is what I'm asking. I want it to be free. Okay. <laughs> That's the perfect price. Go on. Uh, no, I, I, I don't have this thing where it's like, oh, if it's $99, it must not be good at all because I have a Roku, which is available for like $50 or $60, which is great. So I, to me, it needs to be under $99 because I don't think most people associate high price and quality in this space. I think a lot of people look at this and say, oh, this Internet thing, I might want that. Oh, it's over 100 bucks. No, thank you. So I think they almost have to keep it under $100 to get yeah. the masses to even look at it. I mean, and you're right. That is the reality of the situation. But, for example, and Roku is a good example. I like the Roku box a lot. Every time I've used it, I've liked it a lot. But there's just that little extra click, wait, something loads, and then something happens. It's like I'd pay twice as much to have it be like, bleep, bleep, and just go fast. And I don't know, you know, you got all kinds of problems with, like, you know, setting up the stream. It could be the local internet that's not fast enough. It might not be the processing power at all. But it's just one of those things where everything feels on all of these boxes that I've used so far, except for, I mean, I guess really even the Xbox, including that, it's just a little bit laggier than I would like. And I I wouldn't mind paying an extra 100 bucks if there was a way to make it faster. Well, I, I don't think that's a price issue. I think that's a technology issue. Uh, and and I, I don't think paying extra money is going to improve your bandwidth performance. And that's half the battle right there. Uh, I agree. I agree. Uh, so, so I, yeah, I, I think, and I think, you know, the older Rokus especially had, uh, had very low, not low power, but they, you know, they had CPUs that, that aren't as capable as the ones you can get now. But do you have a newer Roku? Because those things are flippy. They're fast. They, they're flippy. Wait, yeah, they, you can just flip, 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 flip. There's none of that press and weight that you're talking about see i've, I've been spoiled because i i was a, a, a teenager in the early 90s back when you had actual tuners and you could as fast as you could click you could see channels and i haven't seen that since and yeah I you guess can't just reach up and go like you yeah right see that's what let's go back to those days i know uh <laughs> no, the other days that we're headed for are high definition tv nhk the japanese broadcaster has been pushing ultra high definition tv we talked about their demonstration at the Olympics, and the standard for ultra-high-definition TV has been approved by the International Telecommunications Union. Japan will be marketing it under the name Super High Vision, uh, and it, that includes both 4K and 8K. But it sounds like NHK is skipping right over 4K, and they're just going to say, look, we're, we're going to go balls out for 7680 by 4320, uh, which I think is something like 16 times the pixels what you have in a 1080p 
screen right now. This yeah. is absolutely necessary. This is absolutely what they need to do. By the way, every single person should watch this video. It is absolutely adorable. This delightful British gentleman walks you through explaining how like uh, old cameras be dumb, new cameras be awesome, and our service is awesome. And then he pulls out this piece of paper and folds it eight different ways to show you how big the resolution Here's is. Your old screen. I know. Here's I love a it. New screen. So what you want to do from a branding perspective is have a discernible, breathtaking difference between old and busted and new hotness, uh, to quote Men in Black 1. Uh, the, uh, and that's, I think it's right that they're focused on, H, uh, on 8K. And it's right that there doesn't even exist uh, really any content or even a manner of distribution that makes this possible. But now's the time they should be focused on that. It should be a five years out project. And when it does come out, please, please, please do me a tell favor. Don't call it anything related to television because at 8K, you have something different. You have something special. Call it a video wall. Put it in its own category, completely independent of what we perceive as television. Call it something totally different. Well, they're calling it, it super high vision. No, that's terrible. That's, uh, that's, that's. What does that even mean? That's just more words. That's uh, ultra mega turbo alpha EX vision or whatever. Ultra like, best call watch. It call it call it the window. Call it uh, uh, come up with a million different things. Just don't call it a television because at that point you're something different. Well, let's move on to film. <laughs> film found all about the things you watch on your video wall. <laughs> or whatever it is that you watch your things your on. Window, your Brian, uh, trademark, Brian Brushwood, 2012. So it looks like sci-fi is going to help develop the remake of Blake's Seven along my with dad, Martin Campbell. My dad loved Blake Seven. He loved Doctor Who more. I and mean, that's the reason I know all the original old uh, uh, Doctor Who episodes was because of my dad. But uh, he also watched Blake Seven. I never got into it. Did you? Uh, yeah, I did. I, I was not. I wasn't like top of my list, but I definitely watched some Blake Seven and enjoyed it. Uh, if anybody doesn't know, it's basically uh, international uh, created uh, storyline about folks breaking out of a prison planet and going on the run and, and on adventures. Uh, really, really good storytelling in the original Blake Seven. Even if some of the some of the technology, some of the production value were a little lower than even at, at the time, uh, the storytelling made up for it. And Georgeville Television has the rights, so they're going to have Joe Pekaski, who wrote for Heroes, doing the writing, and will be directed by Martin Campbell, who you might know from Casino Royale, and they are committed to a script-to-series deal, which means if sci-fi likes the script, then they'll greenlight 13 episodes. So there's no there's no uh, pussyfooting around, no middle of the road, like, well, we'll do a pilot, we'll do it as a one-off special, and we'll see if people like it, and if they like it, maybe we'll buy more. It's just full-on, like, here's the story, here's the franchise, uh, do you think the fans will like it or not? You like not? the script? You like the script? We're going to make it 13 episodes. What a novel yeah. idea. Yeah. Uh, speaking of novels, there's a novel of Star Wars out there that you'll want to put down and go watch the 3D version Next year, 2013. Uh, so, so the idea with the 3D versions of Star Wars was <laughs> they're going to put out one a year. And they have now changed it next year. Instead of Star Wars Episode 2 in 3D, they're going to have Star Wars Episode 2 and 3 in 3D. <laughs> yes, they certainly will, Tom. And <laughs> I care less. I literally... Uh, I, I'm more interested in what my daughter is watching downstairs than in a 3D version of uh, the other prequels. Uh, and weirdly, I think I'm even that uninterested in 3D versions of the original trilogy as well. Do you think that's I, why I, they're accelerating the schedule? They're like, oh, crap, people are getting tired of 3D. We better hurry up and pump these I, out. I think that for the first time in its, what, 25-year history, Star Wars is realizing the limits of its inelastic demand. I think up until now, they've had a money factory that could print money for anything. Anything with the Star Wars logo on it would make a bajillion dollars. And now they're just like, oh, wait, that money factory is running low on steam. Apparently, you have to provide value at some point is what they're realizing. That money factory is low run, running low on money. 
Hmm. <laughs> exactly, right? Uh, here's, a, here's another uh, show you might want to check out. In fact, I think I'm going to start checking this one out. It's called The Booth at the End. It's available on Hulu. Season one was actually produced on City TV in Canada. So if you're up there, you may have seen it on regular television. It was put on Hulu in the United States. Uh, and then season two was created specifically for Hulu. But it's, it's a half-hour uh, drama. So you get, without commercials, 22 minutes or so of content. It's a guy who sits in a booth in a diner. The entire show is shot in the diner. And he gives people tasks to solve their problems. So people come in. They find him in his little seat. They sit down and they say, you know... Oh, uh, my, uh, my wife's cheating on me. And he says, okay, you have to go uh, blow up a bomb in a public place. And they, so, so the tasks aren't necessarily directly related to the problem. But then it's, it turns out because people keep coming back in and checking on uh, their progress with him that, you know, unintended consequences happen that start to enlighten their problem. Everyone's changed by the tasks that they have to go through. And I watched one episode so far because I was a little skeptical that they could pull off a like, guy sitting in a booth the whole time. How interesting is that going to be? It's really well done because the stories are compelling. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you, I liked it. Uh, of the uh, In this article on io9, they compared it to uh, The Monkey's Paw, which was one of my all-time favorite short stories. So uh, I love the idea of a a perverse uh, result of an innocent wish, you know? And I, I think this is great if... Uh, if that's what this is all about. Well, I can't believe that I, I have nine points out. It's not like the monkey's paw in the, the careful what you wish for thing. It's more of a when you have a wish, how committed are you to doing the things you need to do to attain it? Uh, that's awesome, man. And and this was originally was it originally created for uh, 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 Canadian television? Uh, I guess so. It initially ran on city TV. And then uh, and Hulu and then but but now uh, three episodes into the second season just on Hulu. Right on. Yeah. So another good one out there. Uh, also, what, what? <laughs> do you like this headline that I wrote down for you? <laughs> uh, oh, see, I didn't even see, I didn't even notice this was in here. Uh, Star Wars series breaks Brian Brushwood's heart ends 25 year love affair. What are you talking about? What is this? <laughs> they, they announced this at Star Wars Celebration. This did you see the trailer for the Star Wars detours? Did you see this? No. Okay. There's uh, when I read the description on paper, I thought this is great. There's a place for this. It is a a comedy centric Star Wars in the Star Wars uni universe, an animated comedy series, which I thought there is a place for this. How many stories? It's a big universe. There's all kinds of interesting tales that could be told. There could be characters we could fall in love with. Imagine, you know, two, uh, the, the lives of two foot soldiers on the Death Star doing, you know, eh, think like Kevin Smith kind of thing, right? Just this average everyday life. But instead, what the, when you look at this trailer, what it is, is it's just a rehash of the same goddamn jokes we've heard for 25 years with the same characters that we saw for 25 years. And I just, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done with the punchline being it's a trap. I'm done with the punchline being she's got cinnamon buns on her for, for her hairstyle. It's like, I'm just, it, there's, there's so much there. If you would open it up to other writers and other authors to expand this universe, and it just kills me that there's nothing, and this is done by the guys who do Robot Chicken. So basically, imagine the Robot ki Chicken uh, Star Wars sketches only utterly sanitized to the point where George Lucas approves of them, and then that takes all the fun out of them. So you just want to set fire to the whole thing anyway. So that's uh, that's that's where I'm at. On I this. guess we should have had this after the uh, episode two and three story, huh? Yeah, probably. It's all right. Um, I don't know. Even Adam Twelve in the chat room doesn't like it. So and and Adam Twelve is a prequels apologist. He yeah. uh, he is a hundred percent behind the prequels, and even he was like, "No, I'm I'm done. I'm out." So, uh, and Warner Brothers is said no to Stephen King's The Dark Tower. I was really surprised by this, and and uh, the the line in the article, and this comes from uh, what contactmusic.com. They say uh, the, the vibe went from a lukewarm maybe to an icy cold no, which really, uh, I don't know how I feel about it. It's like I'm really bummed because it's such a neat, totally different world, such a different idea for everything. And the fact that they weren't able to make it work, I, I think it's more a testament to the uh, 
the risk averse nature of movie making nowadays where it's like, I mean, I, I understand if I'm Warner Brothers, I'm going to look for another sequel. I'm going to look for an established property that's making crazy money that involves kids for some reason, you know. But, uh, I but heard it's still that somebody else has already started talking to them. I mean, I think what we're, we're, we're seeing a close-up uh, hyper-attention by looking at the Dark Tower that we really want to be made because Ron Howard's attached to it uh, is, is just the normal Hollywood process for almost every book ever written. Mm. Like, they just, they go through this, right? Uh, Scott Lynch had, had his books optioned, but then now they're not going to be made and they're back into to, you know, being available for somebody to option and... I, that's just that's just the way this stuff goes, as I understand it, right? I I think it only feels unusual because we get so excited about the possibility of it being made. Well, and especially because they had such a novel agreement that they were working out, and just as recently as what three weeks ago, we were hearing uh, Russell Crowe being associated with the project. Yeah, but, but we but, see we're we're putting way too much. Uh, these are all rumors. We don't know if I, any of this stuff is real. Uh, yeah, well, let's let's just make it clear. This is this. There's a place for this, Tom. We are talking about this because you and me personally love this franchise and are really interested in what happens here. This is this is not real news. This is us re responding as fanboys to all kinds totally. of speculative rumor. Yeah, totally. And that's why I think it's like a, a part of me is 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 riding this roller coaster of like, yeah, they're gonna make it. Oh, now they're not gonna make it. I hate them. Oh, wait, now they're gonna make it. I love. But frankly, there's probably. A hundred other books going through exactly the same process. They just don't yes. get as much of attention because they're not Stephen King's The Dark Tower. Yeah, and also we're not in love with them the way we are with The Dark Tower. Yeah, but regardless, exactly. I'll tell you what, though. If this means, if it's the difference between something happening now with Ron Howard and something happening, what, five years, six years from now with Peter Jackson, it's like I'd much rather have somebody associated with epic fantasy than somebody like Ron Howard. Uh, Deadline Hollywood reports the media rights capital uh, that, that's who I was trying to think of. I've been, I've been trying to figure this up. Who, who recently did Ted, the surprise hit that won the movie draft for Justin Robert yeah. Young, uh, are in serious talks to finance and distribute The Dark Tower. Well, hopefully that'll happen. So I mean, here, hopefully it'll be, let me throw another I'll rumor on the rumor pile for you. I'll, I'll tell you what. Now, Tom, which would you rather have? Would you rather have no Dark Tower or a Dark Tower that was bad? And I'd rather have no Dark Tower than one that was no good. Well, uh, yeah, of course. No, but not of course, because there's other properties. Like when Iron Man came out, I was legitimately, uh, legitimately like, I don't care how terrible it is. I'm going to see it, and I'm glad it exists because Iron Man needs his due. He's been my favorite comic book superhero since I was in eighth grade. But, like, this one is too precious to me. Like, I don't want it done badly. Well, are you a I, I guess, But this isn't related to media rights capital. You're not trying to imply that they would do a crappy job with it. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm I'm implying that Brian Brushwood's very protective of the Dark Tower. All right. Only Brian can insult the Dark Tower. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. What's premiering this week? Premiering this week. This is what's premiering this week. Check it out. We're going to get sued by Joss Whedon, aren't we? Because you're wearing a blue sun shirt. In that. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, well, first of all, Doctor Who premiering this Saturday, which I have very mixed feelings about because we're going to be at Dragon Con. I'd rather be home on my couch, like getting all excited. But then it's kind of awesome to be at Dragon Con surrounded by a bunch of Doctor Who fans uh, when it premieres. So, uh, but anyway, I don't really care. Wait, 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 wait. It's premiering. Wait, wait, wait. Are you saying you would really sincerely rather watch Doctor Who at home alone yes. than surrounded by the life's blood of fandom for yeah, Doctor Who? Yeah, because I won't be able to hear. Okay, okay, all right, sure. All right, People are enough. too loud when they watch TV. <laughs> uh, and then we got a bunch of movies coming out the, this weekend. Uh, none of them good. At least it doesn't look like it. I don't know. Maybe some of them are good. Uh, the, the Possession, uh, based on a true story, a terrifying account of one family must unite to uh, survive the wrath of an unspeakable evil. 1313 Frank and Queen looks like kind of a comedy horror. We're, we're getting a lot of horror films out. Uh, the Tall Man with Jessica Biel. Uh, slowly dying mining town, children vanishing without a trace, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. Any of these float your boat, Brian? Uh, no, but talking about horror movies, um, I know that uh, the new Paranormal Activity is coming out in a few weeks, and uh, uh, that was way exciting because I actually got called to possibly consult for it, and I guess they went in a different direction, but it was awesome to be talking to someone who was affiliated with it about having me uh, consult and license 
things that I created for the actual show. Oh, that's fantastic. So I, I fantastic. want to see what direction they did go. They obviously didn't go with, with me, but that was a cool experience. Well, let's talk about what we are watching. What we're watching. I watched uh, all of H Plus finally this weekend. I caught up on it, and, and my immediate reaction was, I want more. Yes, yes. So for all my talk about why they should stretch out Arrested Development, if you apply that to H+, then I'm just like, no, all of it right now. They shouldn't be spreading it out because it's agonizing. And some people say that the episodes are too short on H+. And I'm going to say that's only, I mean, if you look at the total content, each one's about five minutes long. They're releasing about five per week. So you're getting about as much content as a half hour series coming out week over week. Uh, I love it. I love the acting I think is excellent. I'm starting to see the story coalesce in there. And most interestingly, it's almost as though, I don't know if, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's almost as though somebody watches this show because last week I complained about how long the title sequence was. And now when you go to the page and hit play, it automatically takes you on a playlist where it starts you a minute in on each episode and the second it doesn't even show you the the end credits it immediately jumps to the next one in the list and and whereas before you'd have those big youtube overlays that say subscribe next episode previous video and it would stay there around way too long now they're up for like just 3 seconds and then they're out they've they've sincerely adapted to uh to, you know they've realized like this is what people are want so let's just give them what they want let's make this thing popular and successful yeah make people want to watch it yeah absolutely well and i also noticed that the, the first episode is now creeping up on three hundred thousand views which still for the quality of production behind this and the quality of talent behind it it's it, it's abysmal to me that 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 so that that number should be so low. I mean, two weeks in, this should be. If you ask me, it should already be over like two million views or whatever. What do you how think of the uh, of the time jumping? Because the way they're telling the story uh, is within an episode, you stay in one time frame, but it's like fifteen minutes after it happened or five years love- before it happened, and it's. You, I, I'm starting to catch on now that we're nine episodes in of like, okay, that uh, that's that person, but but at first it was a, it was a little bit disconcerting. It, well, it is especially because you don't know what the language of the show is going to be. When it first starts, you're like, uh, are these all going to be one-offs and this is all I'm going to see of this character? But by the time you get to episode nine, you start to see that there's really like five major threads, uh, most of them before the event happens, uh, one or two after the event happens. And you start to, as you start to see those familiar characters and you see where stuff heads, uh, like, like, did you get, did you get like goosebumps? Do you feel freaky with that surrogate uh, mother? Getting getting the injection and how ominous they made that that transformation for her. Oh yeah, and when the doctor snaps at her, yeah, uh, that that's it, really it, when it like when it grabbed me because I'm like, okay, I felt like he was hiding something, and then I kind of knew he was hiding something, but right. now I believe like, oh, he's not just a pawn or a misunderstanding, like. He's like yeah. genuinely pissed that he doesn't have the iPhone that everyone else has. That, was, that in fact, that may be my favorite line of everything so far. Is the guys rooting around with broken pieces of of stolen radios? And he says, "What you never joke? You never jail broken iPhone before?" And the chick goes, "Before, before my, my time. time." Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, and that's the brilliance of this, right? The, uh, the writers of this are are tech fans, and you can tell because they 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 work those metaphors and those ways of thinking very seamlessly into this so it's a believable future i love that well uh, i certainly uh i certainly hope that they get more views than they have right now it really disappoints me that the new episodes are only at, uh, it looks like as they come out and granted it's only like four or five days uh since the new ones comes out but it's like thirty thousand views per new episode and it really should be much higher all of you guys should be watching h plus and here's i actually wonder if this will benefit from the long tail of of binge consumption like who knows maybe 12 episodes from now something so interesting will happen that all of a sudden buzz will erupt and everyone will be like you got to go watch all of h plus you know watch the old ones they get up to this one so how do you feel about the amount of views that it's been getting sorry seems legit yeah <laughs> legit. Uh, i've been watching true blood uh almost got caught up on newsroom uh the finale aired yesterday and i caught up to everything except the finale I love the parts in that when they're breaking news and doing news things. The interpersonal relationships I find absolutely unbelievable and uninteresting. Uh, so is, I kind of half love it. 
the the dialogue is unbelievable or the nature of the characters? Both. That's a bummer. Yeah. Uh, Breaking Bad will will save till till you watch it, but uh, another fantastic episode. And I and I I, I I don't remember if I alluded to this on Frame Rate or or, or I was talking about it earlier at lunch, but <laughs> but I watched King Lear on Netflix last night with uh, uh, Ian McKellen as Lear. Wow. As, yeah. From when? Huh? From when? Uh, not that long ago. I don't remember what the year was. How about that? Uh, yeah, and it was one of those points where I, I know it was lunch because I was explaining to somebody that Netflix streaming is not about, I want to watch this movie, I'll go here to find it. Netflix streaming is, I kind of want to watch something. What's around? Yep. And I did, a, I did a search for Shakespeare, and I found all this great Shakespeare on Netflix, and I'm like, whoa, Ian McKellen as, uh, as King Lear? That's fantastic. I want to watch that. It was a great production. Man, there was a, I, I'm sure it's on Netflix now. It just seems, I'm going to actually look it up. Was it As You Like It? The, which one had um, uh, Mr. Mom, uh, Batman? Uh, uh, what's, Michael why, Keaton? I, yes, Michael Keaton is in, I want to say As You Like It or whatever. Uh, I don't know if that's wrong or not, but there was one, I'm certain it's on there, but it's awesome because it's Shakespearean, but he's clearly doing Beetlejuice as a street, as a street guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, I'll have to find the details on that for you. Uh, there's also the David Tennant. Uh, uh, um, uh, oh, and, and Carson was talking to me. And now I can't remember who, what her name is. Who was? <laughs> what were you saying, Carson? <laughs> I'm glad you have the it same. Was much ado about, Carson was telling us it was much ado about nothing that you're talking That's about. That's what it is. Okay, much ado about nothing. That's what it is. Okay. <laughs> uh, but the David Tennant uh, 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 Shakespeare, I think, is on there as well. There's also Macbeth with Patrick Stewart. I didn't watch that. Oh yeah, no, uh, absolutely. Uh, All right. Yeah, oh, I just found it. Much ado about nothing. Let's do yeah. a little feedback, shall we? Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Rate. Oh, yeah. Feedback comes from Jimmy, who says, I tried watching H+, but I don't care for minisodes. Takes me out of the story every few minutes while a new episode loads. There's no reason for minisodes, especially since YouTube supports long-form content. Why not just give me a full show? Hope they learn their lesson and re-edit the show to make it more enjoyable. Jimmy. See, I, I disagree. It's like the only reason I think you're feeling that is because there's just too little to go through right now. I think once, if you come to this as an artifact after it's run its course, you're going to be thrilled with the way everything sets up because it does instantly load each episode. Uh, now, the one thing that, that I didn't like is that I had to keep resetting the definition up to 1080p every time that it that it came on. But outside of that, I found it to be a very pleasant experience. I only like curly fries, and I hope all restaurants will learn their lesson and stop serving anything but curly fries. All right, we got an email from Patrick Wolf that says, I'm a slingbot nut, as Schwid called us in frame rate 89. The biggest reasons I got the sling blocks was blocks. I said bo blocks. Sling box was to save time and money and uncomplicate my TV watching. I live alone and you have a home theater with a nice TiVo premiere in the living room. And yet I spend a significant amount of my time in my computer in my home office. Prior to sling box, I had my old TiVo 3 with two cable cards upstairs. My sling box not only lets me watch TV on my laptop or iPad when I'm traveling or just out and about, it lets me watch my primary TiVo upstairs. No more waiting on shows while they transfer from TiVo to TiVo. No more deciding which TiVo recording shows on. Plus, my cable bill went down 16 bucks a month. The Slingbox paid for itself in less than a year. Keep, love the show. Keep up the good work. Patrick Wolf. Awesome, Patrick. Good to, good to know. I mean, I, and I, I think when we were talking about Apple TV earlier, what we want them to do, and I'm not saying I know this is what they're going to do, but we want them or someone else, if it's not Apple, somebody to make it so that we don't have to use all of these things to do what you want. That there's just one way in that says, I want to watch everything. I don't need a DVR. I don't need to program it. I just pick, I want to watch this show, and it shows up. I think we're a long way away from that, but, uh, but good stuff. Uh, O.C. Alexander in Los Angeles, California writes in, says, I think that if you let the summer movie draft play until September 14th, you won't have a four-way tie for first. I project... That the player real times serendipity will take sole possession of first place, and I'm not that person. This is in the fan part of the competition, on the strength of his or her selection of Expendables 2 as the last pick. Anyhow, it was fun playing in the chat realm, and fun to see Justin Roberts shoot to the top. I look forward to seeing the show with the formal victory celebration. We will have to do that after uh, the four weeks has ended. 
Uh, really, do you think Expendables 2 will make enough money after four weeks to make a difference, in, even in a, 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 you know, the fan standings? I actually think he could be right, but yeah. I'm going to say it doesn't matter. That's the rules we laid out. I mean, that's this is the equivalent of saying, why, you know, if the end zone was 101 yards away, then the Steelers would have won. Well, guess what? It's not. The end zone is 100 yards away, and that's the end Although, of Although, I have to say, there, there, I, 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 while I agree with you that as far as the official results go, those are the rules, those are the rules we laid down, and that's who's going to win based on those rules, there is some validity to saying, well, are the rules correct in only saying four weeks? Because our rationalization is after four weeks, the money coming in doesn't make any significant difference. So if we were to look at it and say, well, it would have made a difference in this case, that may be uh, something to keep in mind no, in I'll setting see. future rules. I don't think that's the reason for the rule. Uh, the, oh, the reason for the rule you is told me. That so well, that's that's why I thought. That. <laughs> well, but 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 I mean uh, I mean that is in general part of the theory behind the rule, but also. The fact that, like, and that's the question that always comes up. They're like, well, what about this? A movie early on can make money for six whole months or three whole months the entire time, and that's not fair. It's like that is factored in to the decision-making. If you're going to pull a Sarah Lane and hold back all your money and buy the late movies thinking that everybody else is spending their money early, then the side effect is you have to be prepared for the fact that all your movies have less time to, to generate cash before before the game actually ends. Well, so it's like, a, there, are other, there are other breaks on that behavior, which is like if you pull, hold your money to the end, you may end up stuck with money too. So I, yes. I, I think if, if, if it turned out that six weeks was really the best amount of time to make sure that all the money got counted, I'd be in favor of counting all the money. I, I would not. I would be in favor of ending this thing as soon as possible, giving Justin Robert Young his stupid-ass trophy and moving on to the winter draft. Winter draft! Woo! <laughs> All right, that's it for this episode of uh, Frame Rate. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash FR. You can watch us live. Come join the chat room at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Pacific every Monday at live.twit.tv. You can email us. Our email address is framerate at twit.tv. Let us know what you think. You might even end up on the show in the feedback segment. Until then, we'll see you next time. Wait, that was I said that in reverse, but I, my predicate... Hey, wait a minute. Real-time serendipity is at number one, and it didn't even take that long. So I was right that the game should have checked have that early on. <laughs> I kind of think four weeks is enough. I, I don't think there's any statistical significance to more than four weeks. I think that's probably I agree, especially since this guy, he was right, and he didn't even know how right he was. Congratulations, real-time serendipity. You are a supreme badass. Congratulations. Yeah. How's it feel to be awesome, guy? I wouldn't know. <laughs> no ad today. This no, this episode, episode brought to you by Dragon Con. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Good Feelings. Yeah. In the power of imagination. <laughs> <laughs> it's brought to you by the concept of love. <laughs> you can't put it in a bottle, but you know it's there. Love. You can't put it in a bottle, but it sure comes out of one sometimes. <laughs>